if if Mr. If Mr. Powell believes in his arguments and that, hey, this is just these, this is the best we can do, okay, then trade places. Trade places for six months. Go work in a production plant. Go live on pennies an hour. And I want to see if you're going to still make the same arguments when you get back from that experience. Jim Keeney gets all emotional and does grandstanding challenge. He misconstrues the nature of the argument that I've made. What he doesn't seem to get is that I fundamentally agree with him that the goal is to improve the lives of the workers. So it's not a matter of gaining empathy for them or understanding their condition better. I understand their conditions stink, and I understand that we want them to get better. The question is, what actually delivers on making their lives better? I've argued in my published works and in short in this video about why mandating higher wages makes their lives worse, why mandating better working conditions actually makes their lives worse. Jim does nothing to actually engage the intellectual argument and explain why those policies would not have the effects that I do. Welcome to episode 136 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. In this Opposing Views style episode, where I talk about a contentious subject and have an expert on from each side to discuss, Benjamin Powell and Jim Keady join me to discuss the ethical implications of sweatshops in developing countries. We discussed wages, hours, and work conditions at sweatshops. We looked at things like the impact of stable socio-political systems on underdeveloped economies, potential solutions to poverty, and more. My first guest, Benjamin Powell, is an economics professor at the Rawls College of Business in Texas and the executive director of the Free Market Institute. Powell is the author of Out of Poverty, Sweatshops in the Global Economy, which is a comprehensive defense of third world sweatshops. Jim Keady, my second guest, has been a human rights advocate and anti-sweatshop activist since the 90s, but is mostly known for exposing Nike's work conditions and treatment of workers overseas. He gives talks all over the country about the moral implications of sweatshops. Be sure to hit subscribe if you enjoyed this episode or if you want to hear more opposing views. This episode was brought to you by NordVPN. You guys have heard me talk about why I love NordVPN. We're on tour right now. Well... Technically, I'm recording this after a brief stop in Nashville, but dad and I are on tour and well, technically it's his tour. I'm doing the opening. But anyway, NordVPN is a lifesaver. It's not as hard as being in Canada where I used NordVPN to get anything half decent on Netflix, but it helps when you visit random hotels that have things on YouTube randomly blocked but not with NordVPN. NordVPN is the fastest in the world. It keeps your data safe and anonymous and did I say it's insanely fast? It doesn't slow down when streaming like other VPNs I've used. I can't recommend them enough. They have a new exclusive offer for my listeners too. This is a good one. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash TMPP or use the code TMPP like the Michaela Peterson podcast, but as an acronym to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan plus one additional month for free. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Benjamin Powell, welcome to my podcast. Hey, good to be with you. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. I'm the executive director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University and a professor of economics here in the College of Business. And uh, I've done a lot of economic research on economic development, migration, political economy more generally. And I guess that's why you invited me here to talk today. Yes, this should be a good conversation. So I think we should start off with what is a sweatshop? So a sweatshop is a factory in a usually in a third world country or poorer country, uh, often engaged in apparel manufacture, uh, although it can vary of what they produce. It, you know, there's no bright line between just manufacturing jobs in poorer countries and something that's a sweatshop in the pejorative sense, but usually they have a bundle of characteristics that could include very low wages by standards that we're used to in the more developed world, uh, poor working conditions, which could be safety issues or long-term health consequences on the job, 
long hours, generally unpleasant working conditions, uh, often or sometimes using child labor, this kind of whole basket of characteristics. And there's no objective criteria of exactly how low the wages have to be or how bad the working conditions have to be that labels want a sweatshop or not. But activists who are anti-sweatshop activists look for places that have this kind of general set of characteristics. Okay. And then what are you, what's your view on whether or not sweatshops are a good thing or a bad thing? Well, they're a thing. Listen, they're part of the process of economic development. I know of no country that is rich today that didn't go through something like having a stage of development where there were sweatshop jobs or at least jobs similar in characteristics of being low pay and dangerous working conditions uh, to what we see in sweatshops in the third world. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm talking to you from Texas, but I'm a native of Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up in a city called Haverhill, Massachusetts. It was known as the shoe city for its uh, 19th century shoe production. My undergraduate was at University of Massachusetts Lowell, uh, Lowell, the heart of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Uh, the jobs that were in these factories in the 19th centuries would be considered sweatshops by today's standards in terms of their pay, their working conditions. Uh, so there is a stage of development that countries go through while you're building the proximate causes of higher standard of living, accumulating physical capital, technology, building human capital, things that raise the productivity of workers that eventually cure the sweatshops themselves in the process of competition with each other as labor becomes more productive. So I don't say that they're a good thing or a bad thing. I say that they're part of the process of economic development. And we should aspire to think about ways that sweatshop workers' lives can be improved. But doing so requires understanding economics, because if we don't understand economics, you're as likely to harm them as to help them. Um, and in particular, I think a lot of what the anti-sweatshop activists have done over the last 20 years have been to advocate for policies that uh, would actually make workers worse off. Hmm. OK, well, we'll we'll get into that. Is it still similar if Americans say you, you said you were from Massachusetts and they produce shoes, but they were producing shoes for Americans. Right. And a lot of these sweatshops are producing products also for Americans, but they're not in America. So is that still a fair comparison? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, who they're producing and far is really not so material to this. I think what's different in today's sweatshops than in those ones in Massachusetts is that they're in a world where there's other countries who are much richer and more productive. So if we think kind of like the process of development in Great Britain, then United States compared to countries today, from that like pre-industrial stage in Great Britain, so call it 1770-ish, to something that looks like post sweatshop, that's like almost a 150 year transition period. For the United States, we're talking maybe 1830 to 1930, give or take a little bit, about a 100 year transition. Well, why did it go faster in the United States? Part of it is maybe some differences in our institutions, and we can talk about those later. But another part is, where did they get some of the capital? It was British investors. Where did they get some of the technology? They stole it from Great Britain. So that long mm. process there, if we think about the sweatshop countries circa 1960, 1965, it's Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, countries that were pre-industrial at the end of World War II, but in about a 30-year span go from pre-industrial to post-sweatshop. Why does it go so much quicker? Because there's international capital and technology to flow in as the world had become richer. And we see that same process playing out in places like Vietnam today. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So anti-sweatshop people are focused on the negatives of sweatshops, and you're saying that they're not all the same across the board that there's going to be different. What, so what are the differences between sweatshops and what are we seeing from the anti-sweatshop people mostly? And what percentage of sweatshops look like that? Well, let, let's be clear, actually. For the most part, I agree with activists about how bad working conditions are and what the wages are in these places. So some people, so my book that you probably saw that got me to interview here is called Out of Poverty, Sweatshops in the Global Economy. And some people have characterized it as a defense of sweatshops, but it's maybe in a, in a particular sense, but it's not a defense that says, oh, the conditions aren't that bad. Oh, the wages aren't that low. It says basically the wages are as bad, the conditions are as bad as what mm. people say they are. But we have to realize that there's one very important characteristic of these, and it's that people choose to work there. Now, admittedly, it's from a bad set of options. Otherwise, they wouldn't be choosing it. 
you or I aren't going to leave our job to go work in a sweatshop because we have better options. But when a worker chooses it, they're demonstrating that in their mind, they believe it's their least bad option, which means if we're going to advocate for things to help them, we shouldn't be taking their least bad option away. Instead, we should be thinking about how to expand options that they have. And the way that people would classify this as a defensive sweatshops is pointing out that these are the least bad options, that a lot of other people's solutions are false solutions, and that part of the solution is the process of development itself. But it's not one that disputes what the actual conditions are there in sweatshops today or at any time in the historical past in this process of development. Okay. Is the argument that there should be a minimum legal wage in some of these countries, well, that's an argument that's put forth frequently. So how do you feel about that? Is that reasonable? No, it's not. So we have, we have to understand wage formation, right? So the most an employer is going to be willing to pay any employee, and this is whether sweatshop or whether here at Texas Tech or wherever, is upper bound of product is going to be worker productivity. In econ speak, it would be marginal revenue product. The punchline is how much that worker contributes to the firm's revenue. So let's say your worker creates $2 a day worth of revenue. The most an employer would be willing to pay them is $2 a day. At $2.01 a day, they're losing more by hiring that employee so mm -hmm. they never hire them or they dismiss them. Now, they don't want to pay them that. The employer, greedy profit maximizers, would rather pay them zero and pocket the entire $2 in profit. What prevents them from doing that is the worker's next best alternative. That's their lower bound. So what is the other option they have to work at? If we want to talk about improving the lives of workers, it's got to be about moving these two bounds. If we're not doing that, if we're just legislating, legislating doesn't make them more productive. If you legislate above that upper bound, some workers are going to lose their least bad alternative and be thrown into the worst alternatives. And that's what a minimum wage does. So, I mean, you could have a minimum wage that affects nobody at you know five cents an hour. There's going to be nobody who's unemployed by a minimum wage. But to set it at a legally binding rate that would increase the wages of some workers is necessarily going to lead to unemploying others. And, you know, when people talk about the minimum wage in the United States and Canada, you know, the politicians all tinker around with it somewhere around roughly what low skilled minimum pay would be anyway. As a result, there's not big unemployment effects. They're relatively modest. Firms don't rehire mm -hmm. as quick. They replace with a little bit of capital. But in terms of sweatshop work, these things can be quite serious. And I'll tell you, the United States, the first minimum national minimum wage law passed in the United States was in 1938 with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And I believe if I'm remembering correctly, it set the minimum wage at 25 cents an hour. Uh, at the time, average productivity upper bound in the United States was about 62 and a half cents an hour. So it did create some un unemployment in the United States. But here's the real twist. It applied to the United States and all of its territories. At the time, average productivity in Puerto Rico was about three to four cents an hour. Put a 25 oh. cent minimum wage and a three to four cent productivity, mass unemployment, business closure. So they had to amend the law so that it didn't apply to a territory. But that's what it would be like taking a, a developed country type minimum wage and putting it in a sweatshop country today. So instead, a lot of them talk about a living wage, which is really just another name for a minimum wage. It's just saying we understand we can't take a United States minimum wage and stuff it in Bangladesh. Instead, it has to be based off of cost of living there or something like that. In practice, these are still minimum wages. And if you set them high enough, you might for some workers be able to get in between those upper and lower bounds. And some workers will get higher pay and keep their jobs, but others will be laid off. And, you know, economists and philosophers, they'll talk about these things and say, but if we're just going to use like a standard of the well-being of workers, maybe the wage gains, the people who keep the job, are worth throwing those other workers into the worst alternative. Economics doesn't tell you good or bad. Economics tells you trade-offs. Mm. So the trade-off is some people get a higher wage, keep their job, other people lose their job. But when we think about this in the context of sweatshops and, and garment production, the numbers are really bad. Because if you think about price sensitivities is really what we're talking about here, of how responsive is the labor supply to changes in prices and how responsive is the demand for workers in response to it, most sweatshops are produced not by multinationals or excuse me, are not owned by multinationals. They're domestic subcontractors who get orders from international brands. So hmm. the order for those factories or the demand for labor at those factories is as fast as the next order. So if the employer, or the multinationals are profit maximizing, which everybody believes they're trying to do, they're already spreading their orders in such a way that 
moving from Bangladesh to Vietnam wouldn't make them any more money on the margin on the next order than from Vietnam to, for that matter, the United States or Canada, where some clothes are still produced. It's higher wage, higher productivity versus lower wage, lower productivity. You're going to equalize across these margins. Once you legislate a higher wage in, say, Bangladesh, then the relative cost of that labor has gone up. You're going to start shifting your orders. So the demand for labor is very, very price sensitive. Now, the supply of labor, if you're a worker in a third world country, you basically have to work to feed, clothes, shelter your family. There's not a general social safety, a generous social safety net. And in my view, unfortunately, we're not offering near enough visas to move to the United States and other developed countries. As a result, the labor supply is not very price sensitive. Economics would tell you, you stick these two things together. And what's going to happen is most of the effect is going to be unemploying workers of a minimum wage. Very little of it will be extra wage for anybody who stays employed. And I just did all that without talking about the ugly word of elasticity, which if any of your viewers took economics classes, they probably had some teacher who sucked at teaching principles of economics. And when they taught elasticity, they calculated all this stuff and the kids were like, oh, my God, this is boring. <laughs> but elasticity, it's about price sensitivity. And if you reverse what I had just said about the demanders versus the suppliers in this market, then you get a very different conclusion. But that's not how this market works. Okay, what is elasticity? Price Can you describe that a little bit? Okay, okay. Right, price sensitivity. So whoever is more price sensitive is going to be bear more, uh, is going to be able to escape. Uh, so because firms can shift their orders between countries quickly, uh, they're not going to put up with simply accepting a higher cost of labor. They'll readjust production to minimize their overall cost. Meanwhile, laborers aren't very free to move to other countries mm -hmm. or to just sit out the labor market. So they just have to eat it. So as a result, that's why you'd get most of the effect in unemployment rather than workers keeping their jobs at higher wages. Because like, listen, Nike, Lane Bryant, pick whoever it is, they don't face a choice of make sneakers or not make sneakers. They have to choose how to make sneakers. And the substitute for low skill, low cost labor is fewer workers and more capital or higher skill, higher productivity workers. And when you change the price of the low skill workers without changing that upper bound, their productivity, then they're just going to move to the substitutes. And that's what we see them do. Hmm, that's very interesting. I never considered the fact that sweatshops are actually competing internationally. So it's not just a problem within countries. It's actually across the world. Yeah, they're competing with each other for orders from the multinationals from uh, uh, around the globe. What they're not competing on so much as workers, because the workers aren't free to move between what they're competing in country for workers, but not between country for workers. Mm -hmm. So when I say, by the way, this is important for people to hear too, about that upper bound being low productivity. A lot of the reasons their productivity is low has nothing to do with, I'm not saying anything disparaging about the workers themselves. I'm not talking about their work ethic, their human capital or anything like that. A lot of the reasons for a low productivity have nothing to do with the worker themselves and everything to do with the place that they're located in. So countries that have low economic freedom, bad property, bad enforcement of private property rights, not a very good, reliable court system, the rule of law. All of these things limit the upper bound of productivity of a worker because it's just hard to organize mm -hmm. economic activity. As a result, someone can't create a lot of value for a firm. So if you take, you know, Haiti is a place where sweatshops have been located. Uh, imagine trying to do business in Haiti. Uh, imagine whatever you earn where you're sitting right now, if we plucked you up and dropped you in Haiti, would you be able to create as much value? No, the whole environment around you constrains you. So a Haitian, when they're allowed to migrate to the United States, their income goes up on average by a thousand percent. That's sticking them in a place with better property rights, wow. better economic freedom, better rule of law, and for that matter, more physical and human capital to interact with. And the same would be true if more workers could move between countries. Um, but a lot of the what limits that upper bound is bad governance in their in their origin or their country where they live. Okay. Interesting. So let's move into then boycotting sweatshops because you see in the media a lot of the time that, oh, you know, it's Nike used as an example. Nike is using sweatshops, boycott Nike, um, maybe buy from American companies that are hiring Americans that are paying them at a fair wage. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? If you like helping wealthy unionized American workers, cool. Just have a buy made in the USA campaign. But let's not pretend that this is for the good of sweatshop workers. If we start from understanding they're choosing to work in that sweatshop because it's the least bad option, and you say, no, I feel icky about buying products made with their labor. Instead, I would like to buy products made with only 
labor that has uh, high wages, good conditions, the right to organize. You can do that, but what it does is it decreases the demand for the workers in the poorer countries, which means more of them lose their jobs and go to worse alternatives. And for that matter, the price they can get that upper bound, if you decrease demand for their products with nothing physical changing about how quick they can stitch a shoe or what have you, their upper bound goes down too. Because part of that bound depends on how much value you create in the mind of consumers. And if consumers value products less because they're produced in those conditions, you've pushed that upper bound down with through no fault of the worker, but through your consumer choices. Boycotts are a bad idea. And I'd say that generally uh, over the last 20 years, anti-sweatshop groups have been uh, moving away from boycotts in general, not completely, but have moved more in that direction. And I think that's a good thing. Interesting. Okay. I don't think I've heard that argument before. So by the way, there's another version of this too, of uh, ethical brand, so-called ethical branding. So like fair trade coffee, you've probably seen yeah. of that. So there's some versions of this with sweatshop and they'll say, you know, we are going to have, there's a group, or at least there was, it was called shop with a conscience consumer guide. And on their, their website, they said, all of the things that we sell are sourced from factories that only use high paid labor that has good working conditions, the right to unionize. And they pitched this as if it was good for sweatshop workers. Well, I mapped out the source factories. They're all in the United States and Canada with a handful in a few Latin American countries. It was basically a buy made in the USA campaign in disguise. They weren't literally lying. They were producing them in factories that said the characteristics they said, but they were pitching it as if this was like, oh yeah, it's a nice factory in Bangladesh. No, there were none of those mm -hmm. factories in Bangladesh. You were decreasing the demand for those workers. Wow. So there's okay. a difference between doing good and, and, uh, or feeling good about yeah. something versus actually doing good. Or as one of my friends has put it about Bono, there's a difference between helping poor people and singing about helping poor people. That's good. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. So you're basically putting forth the idea that buying from sweatshops eventually helps push that country into a better place, right? Yeah. Let me put it this way. Uh, for some countries where sweatshops are located right now, uh, the sweatshops might be the least bad alternative, but they're no panacea that's going to guarantee that they have a higher level of development a few years from now. For some who have, so I'd say sweatshops bring some of the things that, that are the proximate causes for economic development. They bring in more physical capital, they bring in technology, they bring in investment. These are proximate causes, not underlying. Underlying is those other things I mentioned about a rule of law, strong property rights, economic freedoms. For countries that lack those, sweatshops are like a crutch that's the least bad option for workers. For countries who are poor but get those things right, sweatshops are a stage of development that help get rid of sweatshops themselves. And that process happens much more quickly today than it did in the past. So when okay. I mentioned the sweatshop countries in the 1960s, right, think of the Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, these are all people that post-World War II adopted property rights, economic freedoms, and they grew rapidly. Uh, some of the places where they are today, I wouldn't say have high levels of these freedoms and property rights, but they're places that are improving them a lot. Vietnam has made a lot of improvements. China is a mixed bag over the last five, 10 years or so, but taken a long view from say, certainly from 78, but from 90 through 2010, they improved those things a whole lot. So. It was part of the process of development there. Cool. Do you think in the future, so say, I mean, the world is getting richer in general. You say when some of these third world countries develop further and there are fewer sweatshops, are the price of goods going to go up and some of these American companies are just going to be crushed because they can't afford to produce products anymore? No. Uh, so yes and no. So they won't be crushed. And in the end, so let's play this process out. So some people call this, and I think it's wrong, they'll say, it's like a global race to the bottom. These companies keep leaving a country and going to a poorer one. And it seems like it's a freaking scorched earth. Like uh, Hong Kong does not have sweatshops anymore, but it's not like it was left in the dust. What happened? How did the process go? As they accumulated more capital and technology and the workers had more skills, other firms would bid for the labor and the garment factory couldn't afford to bid the workers away. So, so things like toy production and then circuit board production, these are little steps up the manufacturing ladder from base apparel, and the oh. workers are getting bid into them. So now the sweatshop can't hire the workers. So where do they go? They go to a place where the alternative is subsistence agriculture because they can bid workers away from that by offering a better alternative. So you could think of this as like 
one of the first rungs on the ladder of economic development. And the country gets the sweatshops and steps on that ladder, the rung of the ladder. And as they start moving up, all of a sudden, the garment factory can't compete. So they got to go somewhere else. And this process plays out, but the, the end, this is getting back to your question now, what's the end of this stage? Is there, after it goes through East Asia, is there some landlocked sub-Saharan African country who's the last to get sweatshops? And then are they stuck with it? No, that process is still going to happen there where productivity, that upper bound is going to go up. Other people are going to try to bid them to other industries. But now factories won't have the option of going to a place where there's lower, lower price labor without these opportunities. The only alternative will be to have higher cost, lower product, excuse me, high productivity, higher cost labor, much like what we see garments manufactured, which are still made in the United States and Canada and places, much like production is here, where it's higher wage, better condition. Now, what will happen once there's not low cost labor doing this somewhere in the world, the relative price compared to other goods and services of clothing is going to be higher. But we're going to be living in a world that's so much richer that this will be the least of our problems. Cool. Okay. Well, I have some other that. questions. That, that, that's very interesting. I've got some other questions. Some of these might be silly, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, why is it that sweatshop workers don't unionize? Um, there's probably multiple answers to this, but I'd say really when it comes to unionization, this is a sideshow in this. Um, or it's a sideshow in terms of the welfare of the workers in this part of the world. It's not a sideshow in the movement, and I'll come back to that. But when we're talking about people on living standards that are barely above the extreme poverty threshold, we're in the two to four dollar a day type income range, and we're talking about upper and lower bounds, like a union, when it's doing its job, what a union's supposed to do is negotiate on behalf of the workers for better conditions and higher pay, but mm-hmm. it can't ever get it up above that upper bound. Above the upper bound, the employer doesn't want to employ the union. So it's all about that negotiation range. But when we're talking upper bounds in that two to four dollar range, just moving between these doesn't get you out of poverty. It marginally improves your standard of living, possibly. And when we look across countries, about 85 percent of the variation in wages is explained by differences in productivity, that upper bound, rather than the negotiation range. So at best, it would be a small portion of an already low income that they could be improving. But we also have to understand that the main way that unions raise the wages and working conditions of its members is by limiting the employer's ability to hire more workers. But if we're talking, right, that they restrict the labor supply in order to jack up the price of the laborers in the firm. Now that's good if you're in the union, but if you're on the outside looking in and would like to work, it's bad for you. Well, these are countries where these are workers who are escaping extreme poverty by getting their, their least bad option in a sweatshop Unions might help some of the workers who are in the factory, but they're going to hurt their even poorer countrymen who would like to move into that type of development. Now, the reason unions are active in this, though, has nothing to do with the third world workers. So uh, the AFL-CIO, Unite a Garment Workers Union, have been active in the anti-sweatshop movement for years. There's very few members of those unions in poor countries. Their main members are here in the United States, Canada, development, developed countries. They'd have you believe that they advocate for minimum wage and working condition laws for the third world out of, you know, workers of the world unite solidarity stuff. Bullshit. They understand the economics of this. The substitute for high productivity, high wage, first world garment workers is low productivity, low wage, third world workers. If they can price their competition out of the market, that enhances the demand for wealthy workers in the first world. A union's job and I don't begrudge them this in a sense, a union's job is to improve the wages and working conditions of its members. The members of these unions are in wealthy countries. Pricing their substitute out of the market is the union's job. But they're disingenuous when they say that they're doing this to somehow help third world workers. That's BS. Okay. Okay. So you, you spoke about Nike as an example and garment factories, but what about places like Apple? So I remember hearing, and this is when I was a teenager, so I don't know how much of this was accurate, but I remember hearing, oh, Apple uses sweatshops to produce whatever, glass, something to do with iPhones, and conditions there are so bad that they put nets around the factories to stop people from dying if they're trying to jump out of the building. Have you heard this? Yeah, of course I've heard this. Uh, 
I don't know enough about any individual instance of a potential suicide or something, but thinking about this more systematically, like they're not coercing the workers to work there. The workers can leave the job. It's not an enslaved laborer whose only way out is to kill themselves. People have, uh, you know, I'm an economist, not a psychologist. I don't want to dabble in why people would commit suicide under any conditions, whether in wealthy countries or in poorer countries. Uh, but the idea that this is a widespread problem for Apple is mistaken. Um, in particular, I mean, for Apple, they can replace the workers because there's lots of workers who want those jobs. Um, in general, production of the type of things Apple makes will garner a little bit higher wages and better conditions than what you'll find in uh, the more apparel oriented oriented factories. Okay, now, that makes now, sense. Now, if we want to turn to like a another dramatic where it involved a lot of pe people dying, it, you know, some people will say, I understand the wage part, but it's the safety issue. And so not so much suicide, but factory, you know, the Rana Plaza that c collapsed in Bangladesh, uh, a factory collapsed and it killed over a thousand workers who were working. Wow. Uh, this was in 2013, I think. Um, but there have been other factory fires in Bangladesh that have, that have killed workers. And, you know, people say we just have to enforce the higher standards. <sighs> the problem is that the, the safety standards are part of the cost of labor. So just like mandating higher minimum wages, mandating higher safety standards raises the cost of labor and has that exact same type of shift away from those workers. And while it's very unfortunate for the thousand workers who died in that factory, uh, there are about four million people who work in the garment industry in Bangladesh. Uh, for all of them, that job's a step up from the alternative. And mandating the higher safety standard because of the accident of a few is going to employ disemploy many more who are otherwise making their lives better. So some people will say, obviously, it was bad for those workers who died in that collapse. Well, yes, obviously, just like it's obvious for it's bad for whoever dies in a car accident. But we don't extrapolate from that. Therefore, we should mandate such safety standards on cars that fewer people have them. Um, you know, an ex post outcome that's bad for particular workers doesn't mean it justifies passing some law that affects everybody else. Ex ante, it was still a good bet going into the factory that day. Ex post, every one of them would have chose not to. And for that matter, the employer who ended up in jail would have also chose not to. But we live in a world with uncertainty. Is there anything that people can do or that the government can do to make third world countries richer that involves sweatshops? or making any laws that improves condition? Is there anything, conditions, is there anything we can do to speed up this process? Um, I think, let me answer you two ways. I have one answer that can definitely be done with the will of our governments in the first world that would make a difference, but isn't quite the spirit of what you're asking. Um, so the best thing first world countries could do for third world workers is issue more visas. So if a Bangladesh worker's alternative to working in the garment factory isn't just something worse in their country, but is migrating to the United States and getting a job in a kitchen as a cabbie on a construction site, whatever, often that next best alternative that is now higher than their productivity in the garment industry, they'll choose to migrate. And is that development of Bangladesh? No, but is it development of humanity who come from Bangladesh? I'd say yes and that it's really humanity that we care about, not a particular geographic patch of Earth. No one runs around saying, you know, Antarctica doesn't have enough GDP. It's penguins, who cares? Uh, <laughs> at least in terms of output. Uh, but in terms of human flourishing, migration is a form of development for actual humans. And I, if this was a different podcast about migration, I'd say it doesn't make the origin country poorer in the process. But that's probably more than we want to bite off right now. In terms of actually helping for development in these countries, Buying the products, having multinationals invest there is part of the process. But in terms of improving their institutions and things that are the fundamental underlying causes of development, trading free with freely with them, showing the examples about the best we can do, I, I think anyway, I think it's ultimately constitutions and governance are enforced by the hearts and minds of citizens in those countries. And it's really hard to impose them from the outside, at least in any way that makes them them stick. 
if uh, my friend Chris Coyne has a book called uh, After War, The Political Economy of Exporting Liberal Democracy that looks at U.S. government interventions around the world uh, over the last hundred years and mm. says after the U.S. has gone five years, 10 years, 20 years later, how liberal democratic are these places? And the answer is, you know, Germany and Japan post-World War II are the exceptions. For the most part, it doesn't stick. Um, so I don't think that there is such a constructivist type role for outsiders as much as there is a trading role for us of interact on voluntary terms by buying their products, trading freely with them, exchanging ideas and welcoming more of them to our countries uh, is probably about the best we can do on a on a large scale. Are there more micro type things you can do? Like if you're sitting at home and are an activist and want to do something, uh, you know, churches have missionary work where they go open up schools. If you open up a school in a place that has child labor, well, why do children work? It's not because their parents are ignorant, evil, or stupid. It's because they desperately need the meager income of the child in order to support the family. So instead, raise money to do your missionary work where you open up a school and you pay kids to go to school. If you pay them to go to school, you can bid them away from the factory. So like, that's a very micro type thing someone could take on as an initiative to do, because I can imagine someone sitting there saying, well, I don't think I can impact you know, the United States or Canada's immigration policy, but you could do something like that. So the key, now, why is that different? Because we're not mandating what must be done. Instead, we're offering another alternative. You make people better by giving them more alternatives. You don't make them better by taking away their existing least bad alternatives. Oh, I like that. Okay, let's go back to um, immigration for a second. So wouldn't issuing more visas, wouldn't that affect American workers poorly? if there's an influx of cheaper workers available? No, nah, not really. So this is another big area of research for me. I do a lot on immigration. Um, so economists have studied for you know more than 30 years the wage impacts of immigrants on the labor force. For most laborers in a developed country, the low skill immigrants from poorer countries are not a substitute for them. They're a complement. It doesn't lower their wages. In fact, it might enhance their wages. For those who they might substitute, Economists have vigorously debated this, and I, I, I'm not one of the ones who've written these studies, but they get all amped up. And this is very different than the general public. The general public's like, oh, my God, they'll, you know, they'll steal our jobs if it's South Park mm -hmm. right? uh, or they'll push down our wages. The economists, virtually none of them believe that on net jobs would disappear for the natives, the question, the native born rather. The question is the wages. And it's only those. So here's how the debate is narrowed for like people without a high school diploma. When lots of low skill migration comes in to compete with them, do their wages go down as much as about negative 8% or is it still slightly positive, positive 1%? And whatever that is, does it last for more than like two years before it returns to normal? That's what the economists are debating. So they're saying it's a very small effect on a small subset, subset of the native born population and it doesn't last very long. Regardless of whether these people are pro or anti immigration overall, that's the wage debate among economists. It's just not a very big thing because even for low skill laborers without a high school diploma, they're not perfect substitutes. There's one big skill that's usually different and that's English speaking ability. Um, so, you know, it's moving from the shingling on the roof to being foreman of the roof because now you're the one talking to the customers while uh, newer migrant labor does the more labor intensive part. Um, so it's about reshuffling. That's why it's the debate of how long does it last? It's kind of like how long does it take to reshuffle? Okay. Okay. So maybe just explain a little bit. Why does it, why does it not last for very long? Uh, Cause ultimately the natives have skills that are different than the migrant. They might not have been skills that were relevant when the migrant arrived. So if you were, uh, mm. so you said roofing, if you were the shingler on a roofing crew, that was your skill. There is a migrant who's a perfect substitute for that skill. So it might disemploy you and you have to now get reemployed. Well, what skill do you have different? Well, you speak English. So maybe you go to part of the roofing industry where your English language skills more important and your wage goes back up. That's a margin that you're not the same as the immigrant. Um, you know, we could think of the same thing about restaurants of, you know, moving from the back of the kitchen dish washing to the front of the restaurant hosting or lots of low skill jobs of things like like this. Hmm. It's also okay. the, that thinking of more long term dynamic. Uh, if you know there's lots of low skill immigrants who can come into the country, that's a stronger incentive for you in the first place to not drop out of high school and to get your high school diploma too. Uh, more competition. Yeah. Hmm. 
Interesting. Okay. Are there any other main arguments that you have or you know of put forth by people who are anti-sweatshops that you'd like to address? Or did we cover everything? Oh, I don't know if I want to toss up my own things and then knock them down. Um, I would say the most, so when people ask like, what's the best critique of, of your position? Uh, I think that's some, something important. Most people who advocate for a strong position for something should know what the, the best argument against is. And I would say that the best argument against involves those price sensitivities of could we mandate this in a way that lowered the, the, the price sensitivity so the unemployment effect wasn't as big and the price effect was bigger. Um, that's not the way. It, so maybe a global minimum wage. Uh, adjusted for productivity, so it makes it hard to harder to escape by going between countries. Uh, you're still going to substitute capital for it and do the mix, uh, so it doesn't perfectly do it, but it would mitigate on the margin some of some of the bad effect that I have that I've described. But it would still be there. Wouldn't a global minimum wage, after an, a number of years, just go back to exactly how it was beforehand? Wouldn't everything just kind of equalize? Well, it depends how you do it. If you do a global minimum wage, that's a one size fits all one around the world, you're gonna massively unemploy the third world and shift things to the first world. So that'd be an yeah. unmitigated disaster. But if you tried to do some productivity adjusted one between countries, that could limit the some of the switching between countries in response to it. It, it would at least be less price sensitive than simply Bangladesh or Vietnam putting one in place. Hmm. Interesting. But it would still have, I would say it would still have a net bad effect on worker welfare, which just wouldn't be as bad as doing it country by country. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, if people want to find you, where should they go? Well, you can Google Benjamin Powell economist and you'll find all sorts of people who like me, hate me, have done videos like this. But if you're interested in sweatshops, check out out of poverty sweatshops in the process of development. If you're interested in migration, my latest one on that's called wretched refuse, the political economy of immigration and institutions. And if you want the other side of me, who's the drinking, sarcastic traveling one, uh, my bestseller from a couple of years ago is called socialism sucks. Two economists drink their way through the unfree world. And that's an Anthony Bourdain style uh, economics travel history book. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds like fun. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on. That was interesting. All right. Well, thank you for having me. This episode was sponsored by Paleo Valley. We all need collagen. It's like the glue that holds our body together. So much so that tiny lines and wrinkles pop up if we run low on collagen. Paleo Valley's bone broth protein. This guy is, in my opinion, the best way to get the collagen you need in your diet other than just eating steak. But I eat this. I can actually eat this, guys. Do you know how exciting it is to have something packaged I can eat without an autoimmune response? The bones are simmered in filtered water and nothing else. No chemicals. It's pesticide-free and made with 100% grass-fed and finished bones. You can add it to smoothies, baked dishes, coffee, or just mix it with hot water, which is what I do, with salt for a collagen-loaded afternoon snack. I can actually eat this. It's like drinking coffee to me. Although my palate is so weird after only eating meat for three and a half years that I don't think it actually tastes like coffee, but it's reminiscent to me like coffee. It's foamy and delicious and super healthy. I put three of these scoops in hot water. I don't know if you need three. Three tastes good. That's what I do. Go to paleovalley.com and use code MP for 15% off your first order. That's paleovalley.com, code MP for 15% off. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Jim Keady, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. This should be a good conversation. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the way I got involved in the sweatshop issue that we're going to be talking about today, uh, back in the late 90s, I was an assistant soccer coach at St. John's University in New York City. At the time, we were the NCAA Division I defending national champions, the best college program in the country. And while I was coaching, I was also doing a graduate degree in theology. And in my first class, Moral Person, Moral Society, my professor was encouraging me to find a paper topic that linked moral theology and sports, two things that he saw that I had a passion for. I eventually landed by chance on looking at uh, the Nike Corporation and their labor practices in light of what's called Catholic social teaching. And what I found was if you wanted to pick a company that completely violated everything that this body of teaching stood for and everything that St. John's University claimed to stand for, 
Nike was the perfect case study. And at the same time, I'm learning about this over in theology, over in athletics, we are negotiating a three and a half million dollar endorsement contract with Nike. And part of that deal, I would have to wear and promote Nike's products. I initially said uh, privately to my head coach and anyone that would listen to the athletic department that I did not want to be a part of this deal. I did not want to be a walking advertisement that was exploiting uh, poor people in the developing world. And I did not think that St. John's University, the largest Catholic university in the United States at the time, uh, should be a promoting a company that was doing things to workers that grossly violated our mission and what we claim to stand for and what we told the world that we were all about. Eventually, because of my activism on this issue, I was given an ultimatum by my head coach. You will wear Nike and drop this issue or resign. Uh, I held my ground. I was forced to resign. I became and still am the first and only athlete in the world to say no to Nike because of the sweatshop issue. And that made big news. And I was starting to get invited to speak on college campuses and uh, churches and union halls about what had happened. And in my initial lectures that I was doing on the subject, I would have you know, the market fundamentalists in the audience saying, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Those are great jobs for those poor people. What the hell else would they be doing if Nike wasn't there? You, know, you can't compare wages there to wages here. Uh, I knew from my research that they were wrong, uh, but the competitive athlete in me wanted to prove them wrong. So in the summer of 2000, I moved to Indonesia. And I went to go live in a place called Tangerang. It's this massive, sprawling industrial suburb outside of the capital of Jakarta, Indonesia. And I lived in a worker slum. And to survive, I actually gave Nike the benefit of the doubt. I found the highest paid workers in the region. Nike was paying them back then about $1.25 a day. And in living on a Nike sweatshop wage for one month, I lost 25 pounds. And I slept on a cement floor on a thin mat with rats and cockroaches and and spent my days because Nike wouldn't allow me to work in the factory. I actually asked them if I could do that. And they came, you know, went jumped through all kinds of hoops on why that couldn't happen. So I tried to do the next best thing and just live with workers, live on their wages, try to understand what their reality was like and and just listen to what their concerns were, what their stories were. And I promised those workers that I would go home after that month and I would tell their stories. And I thought I was going to do that, you know, maybe six or seven weeks of a speaking tour. And the first year I ended up on the road for seven months. I spoke at 80 schools and I saw there was a real hunger for this kind of grassroots popular education around this issue. And then I formed uh, a nonprofit, an NGO called Educating for Justice. And I spent the next 14 or 15 years of my life full time going back and forth to Indonesia, meeting with workers, listening to their concerns, advocating for changes at the factory, uh, pressuring Nike, pressuring large institutional shareholders, pressuring institutional stakeholders like universities that have these giant contracts with big time athletes like Jordan or LeBron or Mia Hamm at the time was a big soccer player, had a contract with Nike and trying to get better wages and, and working conditions for Nike's workers. And as I said, I did that full time up until 2014, when I was eventually arrested, detained for two days, deported and banned from Indonesia. Uh, I'm surprised it took them as long as they did uh, to do that. So I've continued to advocate from afar. Things have changed a little bit in Indonesia just in the last few years. I actually have friends that have moved up and have fairly high positions in the Indonesian government where I think I could go back there now. Uh, but it really did kneecap the kind of cross-border solidarity work that, that I had been doing uh, for 14 years up to that point. Uh, so now I, I do that work you know, part-time. Uh, I try to help workers as much as I can. I, I get contacted. You know, Sometimes it's on a daily basis. Other times it's on a weekly basis. Different things that are happening at, at the factory. Nike certainly has not solved their sweatshop problem. They're still exploiting workers. They're paying poverty wages. They don't respect workers' rights to collectively bargain. Uh, and fight for better working conditions. Uh, we just had a case uh, we won on, it's about two weeks ago, uh, uh, Indonesian woman, factory worker at a Nike plant, exercising her legally guaranteed rights uh, with regard to the trade union movement that she's a part of, and she was illegally fired. And it took us months of advocacy to get her reinstated in the job. Uh, and these are the realities that workers face, not just in Nike's factories in Indonesia uh, and Vietnam, where I have visited personally, but in the dozens and dozens of countries where Nike operates all over the world, where they're consistently seeking out um, in people who are desperate and in need of jobs so that they can exploit that and maximize the return on their investment for their absentee owners who are also known as shareholders.
Okay. Well, that was well said. What's your response to people claiming that some of these people have no other places to go? That sure. they could have the job or they could just not take the job and it's better yeah. than nothing. Yeah. It's a lazy argument and it's one that really lacks imagination. Right. So let's say, for example, uh, you you're starving, right? You literally starving. And one of the guys who was just on as we were getting the call set up, uh, he's got a loaf of bread. Now, he'll give it to you. Right. But you need to be his slave. You going to take the bread? Yeah, if I'm starving. Okay. Is it a just situation? Is no, he... but is it, is it the bread owner's fault, though? Not necessarily, but we, we could. Can we imagine, hey, we could probably do this differently, right? We need to morally check the guy who's got the loaf of bread and say, yeah, it's, it's actually not right for you to enslave her because she's so desperate that she needs bread because she's starving. Right. So th this is one of my my major critiques with, you know, libertarian market fundamentalists uh, like Mr. Powell, who is going to be on the other side of this argument. It just seems to me that they lack the imagination to think that we could do this any differently. And there's also a wildly false premise. You know, I, I read through, you know, his I, I mean, I got it all marked up. I spent the last two days going through, you know, the ethical and economic case against sweatshop labor, a critical assessment where he's taking people like myself to task. And the initial premise that guys like him start off with has to be absolutely challenged, right? Why is Nike in, in well, let me take a step back. <clears throat> He'll make the argument that companies like Nike and all these other apparel and footwear companies are helping to develop countries like Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did Nike go to Indonesia? Did Phil Knight, when he came up with his plan while he was a student, Phil Knight, who's the founder of, and chair emeritus of Nike, when he was a student doing his graduate degree, his MBA in Stanford Business School, and he lays out his plan, how he is going to go to Southeast Asia and exploit cheap labor and pump the cost savings back into marketing and branding to build this behemoth. When he was making that presentation, I have a colleague of mine who was in the class when he made that presentation. Phil Knight wasn't talking about developing the Indonesian economy. Why did he go to Indonesia? Was it to develop their economy? Or was Definitely it to not. No, it's to exploit cheap labor, period, full stop. To exploit lax labor and environmental laws, full stop. So this ridiculous idea that these companies are going to these places to help these uh, these countries develop and then doing all these these mental gymnastics and you know writing a book about it to defend it is ridiculous. And we as citizens have to challenge that premise from the outset. Nike, th this isn't, you know, Nike's not the missionaries of charity. They're not there to help. They are there to exploit. And then what the market fundamentalists like Mr. Powell will do is is build a Ethereum behind the existing reality. And what I believe we need to do is, is challenge the existing reality right from the fundamental premise. If we want to move people out of poverty, if we want to make sure that people have work that has dignity, that also will provide them with food, clothing, housing, uh, health care, education for their kids, some modest savings, like all the things that you would want out of a job. Is building sweatshops the best way to do that? Now, people like Mr. Powell would say, well, it seems like it seems like it's the best way because that's what the market has done. Well, the market's not perfect, right? There are a lot of, of market flaws uh, and market failures that we could find as we explore this case study of, of sweatshops. And what, again, what I find with, with folks like this, these libertarian market fundamentalists, all they want to do is just defend the reality that exists. And it seems to me they, one, lack empathy for the people who are actually suffering, and two, have zero imagination on how this could be different. Right? And we have markers throughout history where we have seen things be different in terms of social change. So a, a woman like yourself, you, if, if you're a United States citizen, you have the right to vote. Was that always the case? 
Not at all. No. So how did we get there? Right. It wasn't like guys like Mr. Powell all of a sudden sitting in those seats as the white alpha males going, yeah, I think it'd be good for women to be able to vote now. No, it took organizing, agitating. It took women going on hunger strikes, being beaten, unfortunately dying, going to jail to raise the consciousness of the body politic to shift what in social change is called the Overton window to the point where guys like Mr. Powell go, I guess that's a new reality. And then they'll write a study on why that new reality is okay now. Right. It's the so, same thing they do with, with these these economic arguments. So what's the solution then for uh, for sweatshops? And isn't it possible that putting sweatshops some, sweatshops somewhere, it's not the purpose isn't to make people richer, obviously, bringing a sweatshop there. It's to produce cheap products. Yep. But couldn't one of the side effects of that be eventually bringing people out of poverty? Sure. And so here's if, if you think of. The United States, in terms of one of the arguments that gets gets made by guys like Mr. Powell is, look, this is part of the the natural development of an economy. Mm -hmm. Hey, we went through an industrial revolution. They're going to go through an industrial revolution. Look where we're at now. Eventually, they'll get to us. Right. OK. One, where we're at, if every country got to where we're at as the United States, we would need seven planets to sustain the level of consumption. So right outset, it's unsustainable. OK, now, if if we're saying, OK, well, we've got the, these factories and they're currently paying poor wages. There are labor rights violations. We used to have that here in the United States. Well, how do you fix it? Well, all we got to do is go back to history. I mean, there's probably a dozen books in my library that I could pull out that would show you how they fixed it. You had trade unions. They were militant. They militantly organized. They leveraged public pressure and they eventually got the concessions that they wanted. OK. So if we know how to fix that, why are we putting these folks in Indonesia as an example through the misery that our sweatshop workers went through here in the United States? That's crazy to me. I'm an athlete, right? I, I after I, I finish this interview with you, I've got to shoot up to my high school alma mater. I coach with the soccer program there. I coach all the goalkeepers. When I was a goalkeeper at Christian Brothers Academy, my school, I gave up some really bad goals at times. And I gave up bad goals through college. Eventually, I got to the professional level and I got to have as, as first a teammate and then a coach, one of the best goalkeeper coaches in the world, right? my buddy Timmy. And he broke me down and built me back up. Right now, when I'm going to go coach my goalkeepers today, 20 something years later, am I going to coach them how I was coached in high school that led to me like giving up bad goals and it wasn't really good coaching? Or am I going to start them at the new level with the knowledge that I gained over the arc of me making those mistakes and learning the new techniques, coaching techniques that I got from my buddy when I got to the pro level? Now, the argument that someone like Mr. Powell makes, oh, no, no, those, those young goalkeepers now, let them make the bad goals, let them suffer, let them lose games, let them be humiliated. Why? To defend some theory? Like, we know how to fix it, right? So let's fix it. And here's, a, here's another one. So if, if you and I went to Indonesia right now, and we were to go out uh, both within the capital and, and the big industrial areas, but even going out into more of the countryside, what you're going to see is um, fiber optic telephone lines or fiber optic cable lines that are being laid down all over the place, right? So people can get access to the internet, all right? And to have decent, decent Wi-Fi, decent cell phone signals, all that stuff. Okay. Well, I was in Indonesia. My first trip to Indonesia was back in 1993, I remember when most homes did not have a telephone. This is in 93. You would go to what was called um, the Wartel, Warung Telephone, the telephone shop where you would have to go into a little booth and there was a little ticker and you'd say, you know, you pick up, you make your call and the numbers are running. At the end, you're going to pay whatever that amount is at the end for how long you're on the phone for, depending on where you called. Okay. So 
if we're going to follow this progression, right, if Indonesia has to go through the same development that we went through, mm-hmm. shouldn't every house get a landline first? Before we get to high speed Internet and cell phones, shouldn't every house get a, a dial? I don't even know if you remember. They may not have been around, you, but like where you had to stick your finger in. Mm-hmm. Right? I had those. Then we went to push button. Then you went to cell phones that were the size of Mexico that only the rich had. Then you went to cell phones that everybody got that were about that big. And you were only making calls. Then we went to phones that could do text messages and calls. Then we eventually evolved to where, you know, you're basically on the Starship Enterprise where I can lift my phone up and do FaceTime with it, like what we're doing right now. Right. Yeah. OK. Well, shouldn't Indonesians go through that arc of development, according to the guys like Mr. Powell? Why are they jumping? Why are they jumping this natural progression of telephone development? Because it's more profitable for the companies. Right. So if we can if we can skip a bunch of steps because it's more profitable for the companies in terms of development, can we skip a bunch of steps in terms of defending labor rights and paying decent wages if it's more profitable and beneficial to workers? Do you think it makes more sense, though, if we're trying to improve these people's lives to focus on things? This is something that Powell brought up, like property rights and economic freedoms rule of law in some of these countries before focusing specifically on sweatshops. No. And the reason being take, take a company like Nike. Nike is the largest private employer in the country of Vietnam. That's some serious power, Hmm. right? That their actions there could dramatically improve or not improve Hmm. the lives of millions of people, not just their workers, but everybody that's attached to their workers. They are one of the largest private employers in Indonesia. Right? They have tremendous power uh, to be able to, to impact the lives of workers by, you know, if, if it's raising wages, you know, if you, if you take like a, a $16 pair of Nikes, the labor cost on that's about $250, right? And that's going to sell for $100 to $170, okay? Let's say you doubled it and had a mechanism in place where that doubled workers' wages. It was a clear pass through right back to the workers. Well, if I'm going to buy a hundred dollar pair of sneakers and you tell me, well, now it's 102 50. Oh, and the ancillary benefit of you paying that extra 250 is you can help to lift, lift tens of thousands of people out of poverty. Yeah. Most people are going to do that. Especially if there were a marketing campaign that eliminated what in economics is called information asymmetry. So, you know, I know about this stuff. Powell knows about this stuff. The workers know about this stuff. But how many consumers really know the reality of these workers and what a difference their extra $2.50 could make? Right. So Mm -hmm. if Nike spent some money on that, along with their commercials with LeBron and Tiger and whoever else to hawk their products and said, hey, we also want to make a difference. Man, it, it would be incredible. But this it does not fit within their ideology. Phil Knight. The founder of Nike, the guy that set the ethos for this company, is a psychopath. Right? I'm not saying that lightly. You know, there's a great documentary film that I would recommend to everybody who sees this called The Corporation. And what the filmmakers did, they had um, they had psychotherapists and psycho- psychiatrists analyze a corporation as if it were a person, because a lot of this is built on the premise that corporations are people, right? And as legally they are under United States law, corporations are people. So they said, all right, if this was a person, what kind of person would they be? And what they found in in terms of how the corporation operates, that they're a psychopath. And that, you know, a guy like Phil Knight, he is at the head of that. And again, we, we need to challenge this. And there is there are not enough voices coming out of the wilderness to, to challenge it. I mean, I was lucky enough that. Through the work that I've done, I've been able to speak at more than 500 schools in 43 different states. My short documentary film, Behind the Swoosh, is now used in colleges and high schools all over the U.S. My work is, is it's featured in some business ethics programs, all in, in textbooks and programs all around the United States. But there are a lot fewer guys like me than there are like Mr. Powell. Right. And when someone like Mr. Powell is going to defend what these companies do, yeah, he gets money thrown at him. These think tanks get money, of course. 
the big companies want their apologists out there defending the status quo that allows them to continue to exploit people uh, and the planet. Um, now, so here's the other, you know, another part of this is when, when we talk about, we said, we, if we accept the reality, we've got sweatshops. Now, what do we do? Right. How mm-hmm. do we improve them? Yeah. How do we improve them? OK, nothing Mr. Powell and his ilk are doing is helping workers. Nothing. I've been advocating for workers for the last 24 years of my life. Nothing he has ever written, nothing he has ever said has ever changed the reality in the net positive for workers in factories. All right. I can tell I, I know that for certain. The work that someone like myself, my colleagues uh, who are in the U.S. or in Europe that are working in solidarity with brave workers and trade unionists and, and trade union leaders in places like Indonesia, that's what's changing things. I'll give you a couple of examples. So back in 2000, unearthed this issue uh, called menstrual leave. Indonesian women, by law, are guaranteed two paid days off every month when they have their period. Now, usually women in the United States hear this and they're like, sign me up for that policy, right? Okay. The reason that it was put into place in theory, if we're on a production line and I've got you know 15 people on my right, 15 people on my left, the sneakers moving down the line, everybody does their little part. I do my part, pass it on to the next station. If I've got my period, I'm going to have to get up and go to the bathroom. The number of, I mean, it'd be kind of unique. I had my period, but if you had your period, right, you're going to have to get up and go to the bathroom a number of times during your shift. Okay. When you get up from your station, the sneakers are still coming down the line. They start to pile up. You're screwing up production. Efficiency isn't being maximized. Bad for business. So in theory, better that you stay home for these two days. We'll adjust the line while you're gone. Come back when you're ready to work. In practice, in order for a woman like yourself to get her legally guaranteed menstrual leave break, First, you'd have to ask your line chief to get off the line so you could go to the factory clinic. He's going to humiliate you. And the stories that I've heard from women just who are asking horrendous, right? Being, you know, him, line chiefs, letting everybody know that you've got your period, throwing pads in your face, like take care of it. Eventually, if you get to the factory clinic, what was happening, uh, you had to pull your pants down and show blood in your underwear to prove you were menstruating to get your legally guaranteed day off gross violation of worker rights and human rights. Okay. It took us about two years of advocating on that, but it stopped. It didn't stop because of anything that Mr. Powell has ever written about. It stopped because of, it's not because of activism. It stopped because of shining sunlight onto this. I'm going to give you another case with regard to wages because he writes about, you know, wages and raising wages and the, the problems that it can cause so in 2000 and, 2012, 2013, Indonesian government raised the minimum wage by 30%. And there was a factory in Sukabumi, Indonesia, where as a Nike factory, they were refusing to pay the new minimum wage. They said they claim, were claiming, Nike was claiming financial hardship. Remember, this is a company that was doing tens of billions of dollars in profits billions in, in net pro- or revenues, billions in net profits and saying it's a financial hardship for us to pay the new minimum wage. So they, they try to get out of it. And the way that you get out of it is uh, if the union at the factory signs off and agrees, we'll accept less than the minimum, then it's done. Well, kudos to the union committee. They refused. They said, nope, this is new minimum wage. We are guaranteed a 30% increase under the law. Pay us a new minimum wage. So the next way to end run that is if the union committee doesn't agree, but you can get 90% of the rank and file workers on the floor to sign off on the agreement, you can get out of paying the minimum wage. I happened to be in Indonesia when this was going down. One of the union reps reached out to me. What ended up happening was they, they were going around on the factory floor. Here you are, you're a young woman, marginal high school education, came out of a a farming community, and now you're, you know, in this industrial job and just things are moving fast and and you got to produce and everybody's yelling at you. And then one day the boss of the factory shows up, flanked on either side with two members of the TNI, the Indonesian military, 
right, who are not well liked and not well trusted because of their brutal history that they've had in Indonesia, and they're shoving a paper in front of your face, you need to sign this. What are you going to do? You're going to sign it. So luckily, one of the union organized, one of the union committee members clandestinely filmed this on their phone, reached out to me, it went out, I looked at the footage. I interviewed a number of workers that that had happened to, interviewed the union reps who had been you know, bullied and threatened, took all that information, went back to Jakarta, partnered up with a couple NGOs that are Indonesian based that I work with there, held a massive press conference. All the international media came. We hammered them in the press for three days. And within three days, those workers are being paid the new minimum wage. And that was worth over a million dollars in wages to those 7,000 workers in the first year, which makes a huge difference in their lives. And you know what? That factory's still around. And they're still producing for Nike and Converse, which is also owned by Nike. And there's the, those, those, those sneakers are coming out, same quality. Somehow they figured it out when they were publicly embarrassed and their brand got hit, right? And that's been the most effective weapon that we've yeah. had in doing this is to hit the brand. Is it possible that you guys both have aspects that are right? That Nike is this gargantuan company that's, you know, taken over wages for certain countries and then can force cheap labor and that that's evil, but that some companies that have sweatshops can end up improving the economy in third world countries? Again, it comes back to a more deeper philosophical uh, fundamental question. Is this the best way to develop an economy that needs developing? It's unsustainable, right? And it's crazy, like the way the rules are written. Um, so if you and I, if we went to one of the malls in Jakarta that are geared towards expats, towards Westerners, there are Nike shops in those malls. You know, normal Nike store, you go in, there's all kinds of sneakers on the wall. We start pulling those sneakers off. Now, if you're in the mall in, say, North Jakarta, we could go in a number of directions and within an hour hit a dozen Nike factories that are producing those sneakers, right? If we flip the labels up on the tongues of the shoes, do you know where those sneakers are made? Vietnam and China. Because by the rules of the World Trade Organization, and this is a book I'm gonna encourage all of your folks watching this to read, Whose Trade Organization? Right. This is by Wallach and uh, Woodall from Public Citizen. These are the rules of the global economy. And when you read it, you're like, this is nuts. But isn't that crazy that they're yeah, all the sneakers that are produced in Indonesia? Why? Because they give them these tax breaks and create what are called these EPZs, these export processing zones. Everything has to be made for export. That's a really crazy way to structure your economy. But it's to the benefit of the transnational corporations and their shareholders. And we're starting to see some of the, the uh, unsustainability of this model, right? I'm sure you're watching the news and like there are different products that are hard to get now and you got shipping containers that are just piling up in different places and ships can't even get into port. And everybody's worried, you know, about the consumerism of Christmas. Is, is the beast going to be fed? Yeah, because this whole model is unsustainable. And it's also unsustainable from an environmental standpoint. The amount of, of energy that has to be consumed to move a product from Tangerang, Indonesia to Port Elizabeth, you know, 45 minutes north of me, you know, there are all these costs are external. That's what economists call externalized costs. Well, somebody's paying for it. Well, we're paying for it in terms of climate change because the amount of oil and gas that has to get gobbled up to move these products. And why is this system set up in the way that it's set up? Yeah. It's not, it's not to help the poor. It's not to develop local, regional, national, or global economy. It is to maximize profits, period. And we've been sold, the, the, the collective, the body politic, I would say in the United States and around the world, has been sold on this, this model you know, the, what's called the Washington Consensus down in D.C., uh, that this is the only way to do it. And I can tell you this, if we remain on this path, believing this is the only way to do it, not only will sweatshop workers continue to get exploited, but we will accelerate what is already happening with regard to the climate crisis. And 
you will also start to see economies fracture. Because if you think of it like a piece of gum and you start pulling it apart, and here on this one end is this giant blob where all the benefits, profits are aggregating. And over here, it just keeps getting thinner and thinner. Eventually, what's going to happen? It snaps. And what is that snapping going to look like? Political instability. We're seeing that all over the world, right? Food insecurity, starting to see that all over the world. Shortages in potable water, right? I mean, you could go through a whole laundry list. To me, this, the issue of sweatshops, you know, there was when, when students started to take this issue on right about the same time when I was doing my graduate work in a big way, you know, they would say that, um, you know, sweatshops is like a, a gateway drug in terms of opening up your mind and starting to question how this whole system is structured. Uh, you know, what, one thing as I read, as I was reading through Mr. Powell's work, he reminded me of a colleague of mine. Guy's name is David Corton. This is the second book. I'm only going to give two to people watching this. I could give you a whole library's worth of two. When Corporations Rule the World. Okay, it's an international bestseller by David Corton. Corton is no pie in the sky lefty, right? Corton uh, did his MBA at Stanford. He was the guy that was in the class with Phil Knight that I mentioned earlier when Phil Knight presented how he was going to exploit cheap labor. He finished his MBA. He continues on in the Stanford Business School to get his PhD in organizational theory. And he believed that guys like Phil Knight, like that was the way to help these poor countries. That, you know, you, you lower the barriers to trade, you're pumping the foreign direct investment. These people mm-hmm. are going to get jobs in the real economy, whatever that means. You know, the rising tide is going to lift all ships and everybody's going to do great. We're all going to hold hands at the end and sing Kumbaya, right? <laughs> well, Court went out in the field for 30 years working for USAID, working for corporations, working for the Ford Foundation, setting the framework. And, you know, he worked in Indonesia. He would be the one talking to the government saying, here's what you got to do to allow a company like Nike to come in. And here's how it should be set up. And this is what it should look like. 30 years of his life work pushing that Washington consensus, pushing the neoliberal development model, pushing the arguments that Mr. Powell and, and his colleagues, these libertarian market fundamentalists make. And I give David all the credit in the world. Imagine 30 years of your life work and taking a step back and then saying courageously to yourself first and then to the world, I've done nothing to help these poor people. All I have done is help corporations get rich. And for his title, to help corporations rule the world. And to me, this should be mandatory reading. Uh, for every student in in business school, or even if you're not in business school, uh, because it it really gives the framework of how, because he goes historically, how we got here, how we got to this point where a company like Nike can do what it's continued to do. Uh, It tears apart the arguments that a guy like, you know, Mr. Powell would make. Um, And David would be, you know, because when I, I read through papers like this, I understand it. I, I understand the, the economic jargon that's utilized. We so overcomplicate this stuff, right? And part of it is so that, you know, it, it's almost like with, with lawyers as well. We, we create like this, this legal language. So, well, then what do you got to do? You got to pay a lawyer $250 an hour to interpret the language. When we can really explain this stuff in very simple, common sense ways. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, specific to this issue, one, we can have production plants that are making shoes and clothes. They don't have to be sweatshops. Well, how would they not be sweatshops? You'd pay people a decent wage and they'd have a union contract in place or they would collectively own the factory. You'd have a worker owned cooperative. Right? So it's not like I'm saying, hey, we shouldn't have any factories, although I do think we need to question whether or not um, you know, people need seven pairs of Nikes right? With our sneaker heads that are out there. We do have a consumption question that we have to address. Uh, I also think we, we can say, hey, we need factories, but do those factories need to be producing for export, like the current model under the rules of the World Trade Organization in these export processing zones? Well, there are 220 million, probably more than that now, maybe 250 million Indonesians. All of them need good shoes. Why not have factories in Indonesia produced for Indonesians? 
Who's gonna, have- but for, for that, I guess my question would be, do Indonesians have that much money to buy shoes compared to where they're exporting to? Well, they're not going to solve so, that. Yeah. Problem. So here's the thing the, your average pair of Nike sneakers that if you went to Dick's sporting goods, like pick a store, right. Uh, and I'm not talking about the high end LeBrons or, yeah. you know, the, the Jordans that you're going to get a carrying case and promotional stuff with it. There's a run of the mill cross trainer at 75 bucks. Those shoes cost about six to $8 to make. So, ah, if you, so if, you sold, the if you sold them right out of the factory at, let's say, let's say it's a $6 pair of shoes and the factory right now, when they're selling to Nike is making about a dollar a pair. All right. Sell right to the Indonesian consumer and make your dollar a pair. And then that money is actually going to stay within the local economy. And it, um, it's going to increase what economists call the velocity of money. You're going to see that dollar change over at the local level. And it's going to have way more of an impact if we truly want to develop these countries and these economies. Okay. That, that makes sense. But then I guess with these, and I, I know we're running out of time, but yep. would these companies have money to set up production in the first place without having Nike behind them? Sure. Look, you're, you're, if, if there's money to be made, you're always going to have people that are going to look to invest, right? It's a question of what we're investing in. What are the rules? How, how do we set this up? Governments can play a much stronger role in this. Uh, you know, the unfortunate reality is, especially here in the United States, you know, our government, because of the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision that allowed the floodgates to open for big money into politics, whether you're on the, the right or the left, Republican, Democrat, like they're all bought for the, not the majority of them are bought by the big moneyed interests, right? So, you know, you get laws that are passed, uh, regulations that are created that are to the benefit of these corporations. Why? Because they're helping to put those people in office and keep them in office, right? So we really need a, a much broader and deeper systemic analysis of, of what's going on here. And I, I think that What's great about this sweatshop issue, like I said, it's, it's that gateway. And, and as, as far as an issue goes, it's literally touching us, right? Like we're wearing this issue right now. So it's very tangible. It's very real. I think it's easy for people to start to wrap their heads around. But then it does, you know, as you continue down this path, it demands a much broader and, and deeper systemic analysis of, you know, how our global economy is structured, uh, how that filters down from the um, the global level to the national level, the interplay of government and commerce, uh, how consumers and other stakeholders fit in. Like, there's a lot to to unpack. But I think you know, at a very at a very basic level, what's happening right now in these production plants is unfair and unjust. You know, these these are uh, the people who are generating the real wealth. When I say real wealth, I mean, stuff you can actually touch stuff, you you know, the shoes you put on your feet, the shirt you pull over your head, and they're not benefiting nearly enough from generating that wealth. Uh, I I don't think you should have somebody like Phil Knight who aggregates in the billions in wealth where those billions are built on the backs, on the blood, sweat and tears of mostly young women who are producing the real wealth in these production plants around the world. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on. If, if people want to find you, where should they go? Sure. Uh, they can find me on social media, on Twitter at uh, JWKedy, J-W-K-E-A-D-Y, on Instagram at J-W-Kedy, uh, and on Facebook, Jim Keedy, K-E-A-D-Y. And I, I do hope to, to hear from people. If people have uh, additional questions, concerns, want more book recommendations or documentary film recommendations, certainly the educator in me would, uh, would want to provide those uh, or if you want me, you know, if you're a student or a professor and you want me to come uh, to your campus or zoom in on your campus, we'd love to do that as well. Okay. Thanks very much for coming on. All right. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too. Right. If, if, Mr., if Mr. Powell believes in his arguments and that, hey, this is just, these, this is the best we can do. Okay. Then trade places. Trade places for six months. Go work in a production plant. Go live on pennies an hour. And I want to see if you're going to still make the same arguments when you get back from that experience. And then you ask, well, what, 
why should it, you know, or, or he might say, well, Hey, it's, it's, I'm here. They're there. Okay. So again, switch places. And what makes you better? Why do you deserve Mr. Powell? I'm going to guess, and I could be wrong and I'm open to him challenging me. Why do you deserve a six figure salary, a nice home, a nice car, retirement savings, not being beaten at work, not being sexually harassed, not go through the whole laundry list of issues that factory workers deal with. Why do you deserve what you've got? And they don't because by all you were born 13,000 miles away in a country that went through that awful period. And you're standing on the, the shoulders of that. Now other people had to suffer and die. Right. So now, Oh, it's their turn over there. No, let it be your turn. And if you're not willing to let it be your turn, then you know at a guttural level, fundamentally, that there's a problem with this system. There's a problem with your arguments if you're not willing to trade places, right? And I've laid this challenge out to athletes, to elected officials, to Phil Knight, the chairman of the board at Nike, and I'll lay it out to power. Let's go to Indonesia. I'll go back. I'll go back for a month. I'll do the same experiment all over again. And you and I will sleep on the cement floor together. We'll fend off the rats and the cockroaches at night. You'll feel the pangs of hunger as you're trying to survive on a Nike sweatshop wage. And I'll guarantee you, you'll chicken out like every other person that I put this challenge to. You won't do it because not only will it test you as an individual, it's going to test all of the nonsense that you write in your economic theorizing because it's going to get real then. It's going to get real for you. And these aren't going to just be things that you're writing about for some trade publication. Now it's going to, to hit you on the human level. And my hope would be that once you've had that experience, you know, there's uh, Father Colvinback, who was the superior general of the Jesuits a number of years back, Jesuits, Catholic order of priests. He had said in a famous speech, when the mind is touched by direct experience, the heart may be challenged to change, right? May. So I want to offer that to Mr. Powell, right? We're not going to go like, as, and I'm, I'm looking, I, I'm trying to find, I've, I've researched, I've read his stuff, I've looked at other things. I really don't see anywhere where he has spent a fair amount of time sitting with workers in their reality, listening to them, not cherry picking to try and find things that are going to defend what he's talking about but really getting to know people in a human way. If it was his, a relative of his, a daughter, a sister, who had to prove she was menstruating, right? Who was illegally fired. Would he say, well, hey, this is the case for sweatshops. You just got to deal with it. Suck it up. This is part of development. Or would he be fighting with righteous anger to try to transform that situation and that system? I'd like to believe the latter. But I don't know because he's not in that spot. So if he wants to put himself in that spot, the invitation stands. Okay. And on that note, I do have to run. Okay. Thank you very right. much for coming you got on. It. Yep. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Jim Keeney gets all emotional and does grandstanding challenge. He misconstrues the nature of the argument that I've made. What he doesn't seem to get is that I fundamentally agree with him that the goal is to improve the lives of the workers. So it's not a matter of gaining empathy for them or understanding their condition better. I understand their conditions stink, and I understand that we want them to get better. The question is, what actually delivers on making their lives better? I've argued in my published works, and in short in this video, about why mandating higher wages makes their lives worse, why mandating better working conditions actually makes their lives worse. Jim does nothing to actually engage the intellectual argument and explain why those policies would not have the effects that I do. I do talk about things that would make their lives better, giving them more migration visas to a richer country, how the process of development has lifted people out of poverty in the past, how paying kids to go to school instead of work in factories can help lower child labor. Those are positive things that can be done. What Jim lives in is a world where he doesn't have an intellectual argument of why his favorite policies would actually help the workers. So instead, he spends his time making grand gestures and appealing to people's emotions. Thinking with your brain, not feeling with your heart, is the way to help these workers. And if Jim really wants to do challenges, I suggest that he take up the challenge of learning economics so he can understand price theory, because without understanding that, 
He ends up for advocating for things that actually hurt the workers he purports to say that he wants to help. They deserve better. 